So this, this final session this afternoon conference, um, as we got framing this topic, it was really important to us to talk about, okay, if we can come to some kind of understanding about patterns of use and maybe what addiction is or isn't, what are the options for what do we do? And I think that there are some clear-cut cases where addiction means something and then there's some gray areas. I hope you're starting to see how, how complex this can kind of be to slice and dice. But this panel is going to try and talk a little bit about what do we do, what are the next steps, what are the insights that we've learned at this conference that might help us move forward. Whether it's about um, the specific use patterns or it's about the person, that will come out in the panel discussion. Um, also, as a part of this, it turns out that several of our panelists write for ProTalk, which is a blog on Rehabs.com. Now, Rehabs.com is a for-profit uh, company that sort of tries to be an internet clearinghouse, and I'm oversimplifying, an internet clearinghouse for treatment programs. Um, they did us a huge favor by sending out a lot of our publicity to their client base. So we want to acknowledge that, that they were instrumental in getting a lot of our publicity out to a, an audience that we don't normally uh, reach. So we thank them explicitly for that. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Tom Crady, who is a vice president of the college. And while we normally have faculty who know quite a bit about the, the speaker's area introduce our guests, we thought it was very fitting that Tom Crady would introduce our panel since his dissertation in, uh, was on um, unwritten normative drinking behaviors, alcohol use, in fraternities. So he knows a little bit about this topic. So, Tom? Thanks, Scott. Well, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel today, and I'm going to start with Ann Fletcher, MSRD, who is nationally known, award-winning, and mental, a medical writer, speaker, and consultant on the topic of weight management and lifestyle change, as well as the treatment and recovery of addiction. She spent nearly five years writing a book in, called Inside Rehab, The Surprising Truth About Addiction and Treatment and How to Get Help That Works, which was published by Viking in February of 2013 with an accompanying ebook titled Holistic Rehab Therapies Are Alternative Approaches Helpful, Harmful, or Head Games? Also the author of a New York Times bestseller, Sober for Good. Anne currently works as a peer support and family services specialist at Minnesota Alternatives Outpatient Program in Minneapolis and is also the lead columnist for the online forum ProTalk and rehabs.com. Dr. Willenberg, Willen, Willenbring, excuse me, is director of the Treatment and Recovery Research Division of the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism National Institutes of Health. Prior to his current appointment, he was professor of psychiatry at the University of Minnesota. He is a board certified general psychiatrist with added qualifications in addiction and forensic psychiatry. In his research, he has worked to develop test innovative management strategies for patients with complex addictive problems such as combined mental health and addictive disorders, medically ill heavy drinkers, and homeless public inebriates. He has also played a leading role in developing the evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for treating addictive disorders and co-led a national initiative to determine the utility and feasibility of implementing practice guidelines on the treatment of addictive disorders when the, within the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. In his current position, he works to stimulate new directions in research on treatment and recovery, health services research, and to, set, to disseminate new research, research findings and to facilitate their adoption. Dyker, uh, Dr. Michael Pantalon is a senior research scientist in the Department of Emergency Medicine, assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and lecturer at Yale University Psycho uh, Psychology Department. He is also co-founder of the Center for Progressive Recovery, whose philosophy is that recovery comes within the addicted individual versus outside pressure. Thus, the responsibility to change 
is place in the hands of the addicted individual by acknowledging that he, is, he or she is free to decide whether or not to change, internal locus of control. Free to decide why they might want to change and free to choose how they would like to change. Finally, we have William Cope Myers, who is the Vice President of Public Affairs and Community Relations at the Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation. He has been in the forefront of the national recovery advocacy efforts for more than 20 years, carrying the message about addiction, treatment, and recovery to public policy, philanthropy. Moyers brings a wealth of professional expertise and an intimate personal understanding of communities across the nation. He uses his own experiences to highlight the power of both addiction and recovery. Moyers is an author of Broken, My Story of Addiction and Redemption in 2006, a memoir that became a New York Times bestseller. And Now What? An Insider's Guide to Addiction and Recovery 2012. Many of Williams' nationally syndicated columns were recently compiled in a new e-book entitled Beyond Addiction. Volume 1, he has appeared on the Larry King Live, Oprah, and is a regular contributor to Good Morning America. As a former journalist for CNN, his work has been featured in the New York Times, US Today, U US Today and Newsweek. At this point, I'm going to turn it, turn it over to Peg O'Connor, who's going to facil facilitate the panel. Thank you, Peg. Thank you, Tom. When we conceived this panel, we knew that there would be a set of questions that would continue to pop up. And uh, we've seen the kinds of disagreements we have about trying to figure out <laughs> what addiction is or when something moves from just drug use into something slightly more problematic. And we knew that it was really important that within all of these conversations that we talk about, so what do we do? So in this panel, we've got four questions that our panelists will address somehow. And within this constellation of questions are the following. What counts as effective treatment? Along with the embedded question, what is or what are the goals of treatment? What's working? What's not working? What are the ways we treat, if that's even the right word, people who have mild to moderate substance use disorder? And then four, what insights from the conference might influence clinical practice? Now, they won't take these one at a time, but in their comments, they will address various parts of that. So each will have about five to 10 minutes to, to speak. And our order is Ann Fletcher, Mike Panalone, Mark Willenbring, and then William Moyers. And then it will open to conversations between them. But if you are in the audience, you want to write a question and send it up. So we'll have about an hour for that. And then for that last half hour, we'll put the rest of the band back together. The other conference participants will join us for that final half hour. So Ann Fletcher. Hi. I'm going to address the questions, or at least some of them, in the context of sharing some of the findings from my latest book, Inside Rehab, and the research that I did for that. After one of Lindsay Lohan's early rehab visits, it was kind of the early period when Lindsay and um, Britney Spears were in and out of rehab, a leading addiction researcher told me that when a People magazine reporter came to him and said, how can we find out what goes on inside these places, in these rehabs? The researcher, who happened to be a friend of mine, said to me, I have no clue. Mm -hmm. I thought, if these researchers have no clue, the people who are working in this field Nobody seems to know what goes on inside these places. Another prominent treatment researcher, Thomas McClellan, regularly filled me in on his research about gross shortcomings he was finding in addiction facilities that he was studying across the nation. <clears throat> so in 2008, I set out on my own to to, on a, what became a five-year journey to study our addiction treatment in the United States. Coast to coast, I visited 15 facilities, everything from celebrity rehabs, famous 12-step residential facilities, programs, outpatient programs that treat indigent people, um, rural outpatient programs and residential programs. I wanted to get a whole smattering of different types of facilities. The research process included interviewing hundreds of clients and their families who had been through some, kinds of, some kind of treatment as well as many leading experts in the field. In fact, that's how I got to know some of the people on this panel. 
before addressing the questions proposed um, to our pa uh, to the panel in the context of my findings, I'll first sh share a few facts about treatment or reiterate some of what we said earlier very briefly. Of the more than 21 peop people in this country with drug and alcohol use disorders, which is the proper term that we now use, we talked about the DSM earlier, how we diagnose substance problems, of the 22 million people who have one of these problems, only about one out of 10 receives treatment in this country. While many who need addiction treatment don't receive it, as we said early, the, earlier, the truth is that many don't need what we, what we think of as treatment, treatment, going to a rehab or an outpatient program. Um, we talked about how drug and alcohol use problems fall on a wide continuum. They can be mild, moderate, or severe. Most people with drug and alcohol problems, including those that are severe, get better on their own. Those that are severe are the ones that are more likely to need treatment. Um, but pe people who either get better on their own by going to a pri this is most people, get better on their own by going to a private therapist or expert or by attending support meetings. Support meetings could be AA, Smart Recovery, they could be some kind of a church group. There are many, many, many different ways to recover from a drug or alcohol problem. And by the way, AA is not treatment. AA is informal, it's an informal support group. It's not considered treatment. Of those who do go to addiction treatment, far more do it, far, far more, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but far, far more do it in outpatient than inpatient settings, despite the fact that the knee-jerk reaction of most people when somebody has a problem is, oh, you gotta send them to rehab. This is perpetuated by television shows. This is what we see all the time when somebody has a drug or alcohol problem. And the research suggests that overall, outcomes are not better for residential or often the two terms are used synonymously, residential inpatient treatment, than they are for outpatient treatment. Turning back now to my book research findings, which uncovered many things that aren't working in treatment, including both residential and outpatient settings, I'm gonna to refer to them as shortcomings. I'm also gonna reveal areas for more effective treatment that could help more people. Um, I'll also share, too, that I've seen some signs that things are beginning to change since the book was published. The first shortcoming, I'm just going to address three major areas. The first shortcoming is that addiction treatment in this country tends to be one size fits all. The, the more options we have, the more people could be helped. Remember I said that about one out of ten people with a substance use disorder gets help in this country. So what are some examples of one-size-fits-all treatment? We predominantly have group treatment in this country. Dr. Thomas McClellan, who is the co-founder of a very prominent treatment research institute, which is affiliated with Penn in Philadelphia, is known for saying, if you go to just about any addiction program in this country, the major activity is group. If that doesn't work, they'll say, try group. And when all else fails, they'll suggest group. Um, at residential rehab, these are from the rehabs I visited, where some I stayed for um, five days to a week. Um, and I have to give tremendous credit for these programs to let a stranger, a writer, come in and stay amongst their midst and, and sit in on treatment with their, with their clients. I give them tremendous credit for allowing me to do this. Um, at, res at residential rehab, there's some type of group counseling, education, lecture, or other group activity about eight hours a day at many places. This doesn't include meals. Um, individual counseling can easily be five hours a week or less. Outpatient. Outpatient model in this country is typically three hours of group treatment three times a week, sometimes with no individual counseling at all at some places. Despite its widespread use, and there can be great value in group therapy, but despite its widespread use, um, it has not been well researched and we know relatively little about its effectiveness for treating substance use disorders. Um, there's no evidence that it's critical to the recovery process, despite what Dr. Drew has said on TV, you have to have group treatment to get well from addiction. Um, there's no evidence of, of that, and of the many people I interviewed, some of them said, I could never speak in a group. 
I could never speak up in an AA meeting. Um, some of them said I wasn't able to get well until I found an individual therapist who was willing to work with me alone. Another example of one-size-fits-all treatment is what I call AA ubiquity. Seven out of, um, there had been some very distorted, in a negative way, um, a negative to AA, figures that had been going around because of some popular books in this country. Um, these, this is the best I could come up with. Seven to eight out of 10 programs in the US um, are based, uh, there, it's hard to find data on this, but about seven to eight, 10, seven to eight out of 10 programs, treatment programs in the US involve the 12 steps of AA in some fashion. But studies suggest that the dropout rates are quite high. One review of the literature suggested that between six to eight out of 10 people with severe alcohol problems who are encouraged to attend AA while in treatment will stop attending AA in less than one year. Now, that doesn't tell us anything about the people who will drop out and they may come back again, but the dropout rates are fairly high. Again, if we offered more options and we told them about more options in treatment, it's believed that more people would be helped. What would boost the efficacy of treatment? Choices and flexibility. Um, this is a quote from a major gov government publication. Motivation for participating in treatment is heightened by giving clients choices regarding treatment goals and types of services needed. Offering a menu of options increases treatment effectiveness. Clients often have a really good sense of what helps them. Many people have been through treatment time and time again, and they have a pretty good idea of what's going to be effective and what's not for them. But they're often told things like, your own best thinking got you here, um, when in fact, um, they, they have a pretty good idea from their past experiences that that kind of treatment hurt me in the past, and this would help me a lot better. Most addiction treat, um, the second major area of shortcomings, I said I would address three, is the second one is that there's a huge gap between science and practice. Most, um, we, we know about science-based practices that have been shown to be, to increase the effect, uh, to produce better outcomes in addiction treatment. And I believe Dr. Willenbring will be talking about some of these. Most addiction treatment programs say that they're using effective scientific approaches shown to be effective in scientific studies, and they are to a certain extent, but they're often not using them in ways that they were shown to be effective in scientific studies. One researcher went into programs, typical treatment programs, and she found that often what went on in those programs, she defined it as chat there was not um, a lot of evidence-based treatment going on. She said that it was so rare as to be almost undetectable. Another example of the gap between science and practice, we have medications, numerous medications, that can help people with alcohol problems. But only about 25% of facilities, treatment facilities, reported that they offer, offered any of them in the latest survey of treatment programs in the US. Although we know that long-term use of medications such as methadone and suboxone lower death and relapse rates substantially for people addicted to prescription pills and heroin, they are grossly underused in this country. Third major shortcoming, coming. The things that we think should protect us in this country don't. Licensing and certification of programs provide no guarantees. The main accrediting bodies for rehabs don't assure that science-based care is offered. Um, being state licensed, some of the major accrediting bodies for addiction treatment programs are major, mainly quality control measures. They don't assure that they're using science-based treatment. Finally, often people in this field are inadequately trained. There was a major study that was done by a group called Casa Columbia, um, they surveyed the state of addiction treatment in many, many different areas a couple of years ago, all across the country, and they looked at the qualifications for becoming an addiction counselor. Addiction counselors provide most of the treatment in addiction programs. They found that six states have no degree requirements for becoming an addiction counselor. 24 required only a high school equivalency or an associate's degree. 
This is really disturbing given the complexity of treating a, uh, substance use disorders and the fact that more than half of people with a substance use disorder have another co-occurring um, mental health problem. One expert said to me, in few other fields do we play some of the most difficult and complicated patients in the healthcare system with some of the least trained folks among us. What we need to make this better is to require better and more training, at least a master's degree for people in the field, um, as it is for any other mental health problem. Um, so, the other thing too is that we need uh, therapists with empathy and respect, um, not telling people that we know what's best for you, but people who will meet you where you are and uh, where, what you're ready for in treatment. Thank you. Mike Pantalone. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your concern about this topic. And thank you to my panelists uh, for their passion in the area and for all the presenters. I think it's fantastic that we have this many people here who are concerned about the topic of addiction, problematic substance use, whatever you want to call the condition. And I am thrilled to be here. I want to thank Gustavus for inviting me to this very important and frankly magnificent conference. I've, it's been wonderful. So my aim today is to tell you that in no uncertain terms, we have a science of the treatment of addiction. It is not a perfect science, nor is any other, but we do know a good many things about what constitutes effective treatment. We know what outcomes we get from certain treatments, and even if they're not as effective as we'd like them to be, we know what their effectiveness is. And as a scientist, a therapist, an educator, that is critically important to me. And I think it is probably very important to you. So while Anne did a fantastic job of setting up what, what isn't working and what we need in there, I'm not going to repeat that. I mean, that's, that's often what I speak to audiences about. What I'd like to do is to pick it up from there, it's such a great setup for me, and to give you the highlights in three arenas of what I think anyone should know if they really want to help a friend or family member with an addiction. Does that sound good? How many of you care about someone with an addiction? Right. Thank you. Okay. So what are these treatments that are scientifically supported? In two general categories, psychotherapy and medications. I don't want to get too technical or get into the descriptions of the therapies, but it's too rare that general audiences, such as yourselves, and they're probably they're professionals in the audience as well, know what these actual therapies are. So forgive me, but I'm going to give you the technical names so that you can Google them, search them, and grill providers about them until you are certain that they actually provide these, because this is your best fighting chance to help your loved one get good treatment. And by the way, Anna's right. You don't necessarily or immediately or even ever necessarily have to go to rehab in order to get well. It does help a great many people who are very medically compromised and who cannot string together even a few hours of not using to have a conversation with someone. But by and large, intensive outpatient treatment works just as well if it has evidence-based treatments in it. Uh, and it's about a tenth of the cost. So the psychotherapies are cognitive behavioral therapy, where we teach people how to regulate their emotions, how to change their environment so it doesn't produce more cravings than what their brain is already doing. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps people understand that they are not powerless, that they have power to control their surroundings, their thoughts, their feelings, and their behaviors to an extent, but often that extent allows them the ability to either cut down or stop using. Motivational enhancement therapy is the opposite of what you typically think of when you think of talking to someone with an addiction. Um, you know, every, anyone ever heard of tough love here, right? 
Okay, tough love is the opposite of motivational enhancement therapy. Tough love is saying, you better, you ought to, you have to, please do it for me or else. Whereas motivational enhancement therapy says, let's meet you where you're at. What are the things that are going wrong for you? If someone is a willing uh, addicted person and then partially unwilling, where's the piece of this that you don't like? Let's start there. And does not demand anything. It says to the person, tell me what upset you have with your drinking or your drug use. Why might you want to change? Non-confrontational. So cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy. And to be fair, there is something called 12-step facilitation. It is a professional individual, one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy that a, a former U of M uh, grad developed, who's a colleague of mine at Yale, that has been shown in some studies to be effective. Unfortunately, virtually none of the rehabs that practice a 12-step based approach use 12-step facilitation. But if you find a therapist in your community or a clinic that does that and they adhere to that model, that can also be an effective option. In terms of, we'll talk about how to get people into treatment in the second point, but in terms of medications, how many of you have heard of the medication Suboxone? Okay. How about Methadone? Okay. How about Naltrexone? All right. Acamprosate? Topamax? Okay. Those are our medications to treat addiction. And I urge you, we're not gonna spend the time here, I urge you to get over the idea that you cannot or should not treat one addiction, an addiction with a drug. It, it just does not hold water. The evidence is clear. A combination of scientifically supported psychotherapies like the ones I mentioned, and there are a few more, but those are the highlights, and a medication can not only help someone recover, but can save them from overdose death. I mean, I'm sure you've heard about opioid-related overdose deaths. The rates have quadrupled since 2002 and 2013. I think that's what's bringing us closer to evidence-based treatment of addiction because we're going to keep losing our children if we don't get the facts, if we don't pressure our clinicians, our community, our politicians, our payers to support truly scientifically supported treatment. My second point is that which most of our society thinks will get someone into treatment actually does not work very well. In fairness, it hasn't been studied much, but the results we have so far are not very, um, not very positive, and the alternatives work a lot better. Not perfectly, but how many of you have heard of interventions or have seen it on TV, right? You circle, you surprise and circle your loved one, and you confront them with the things that they've done when they've been drinking or using drugs in order to cajole, force, convince, coerce them into treatment. Usually there's a van waiting outside, okay? That's traditional interventions. Um, the science shows very clearly that those people who go through that go at a rate of 20%. 20% of people get in the van, okay? You might think, okay, I'll take my chances with that. But keep in mind that 80% of those 20% leave the rehab before the 28 days are up. Okay. Now, now the rate is substantially reduced. If you compare it to something called CRAFT, C-R-A-F-T, it's an acronym, Community Reinforcement Approach and Family Training. But just remember CRAFT, because if the person you're talking to doesn't know what it stands for, hang up, okay? <laughs> CRAFT gets people into treatment at a rate of 64 Again, not perfect, we're still working on it. But what we're learning is that the strategies that give you that increase of engagement and treatment run almost completely counter the tough love confrontational approach. I have to admit, those are highly satisfying approaches, right? Think of someone you're upset with and you unload on them, right? Isn't that a little satisfying for the moment? But how does the relationship go after that? Okay, so there is a pull to it. But I like to say, tough love makes love tough. And if you don't get them on that time, if they're not one of that rare 20%, then you're out and you may not be able to speak to that person about their addiction again. So the more motivational approaches, craft, talking to people about what dissatisfies them about their drug use, 
ultimately does far better to get them into treatment. I do research and work in the emergency room at Yale New Haven Hospital, and we have a clinical team and we have research to show that when you do a five to 10 minute intervention that completely takes out anything confrontational, lecture -y, didactic, telling and selling, all you need to do is, is ask a few poignant questions about why this person might self-elect to try some treatment, outpatient treatment. We get those folks into treatment at a rate of 65% in the emergency room, most of whom didn't even come in because of an addiction or substance-related issue. They look at me and they say, I broke my arm, why am I talking to the shrink? Well, they scored high on our questionnaires, and so we can get people into treatment with that approach. Um, so the last thing is that because the one-size-fits-all doesn't work in treatment, it also doesn't work in terms of social support. I have no illusion that one session a week or even three hours a day for three days a week in an intensive outpatient setting is going to be enough for your loved ones. They need your involvement. And if that's tough, as it can be sometimes, they need social support day to day. We have a fantastic option that is available 24-7, and that is AA and NA. Unfortunately, many people, as Anne was saying, don't, don't go there. Now, in fairness, they were there when psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians, and, and lots of society didn't care to deal with the substance-using person. Uh, and for that, I, I give them great credit, and I've known people who have recovered that way, but we need another social support option. That's why I train people to be recovery coaches, people who are informed about the science that I'm telling you about, who can help, help you and your loved ones find the best treatment and motivate your loved ones to stick with it and make the best use of it. So my mission is effective help for all, and I'm hoping that we conveyed some of that information to you today. So, thank you. Mark Willenbring. I was going to say, she hasn't died yet. Mm. Well, she been here? <clears throat> well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's great. I feel a great uh, honor just to be part of this and uh, to be uh, able to see in person uh, uh, one of my great heroes, Eric Nessler. Um, I'm sorry, Eric Nessler. Er Eric Candell. Uh, um, Carl Hart, and um, uh, it, it's a, a great privilege. I'm going to concentrate on um, future directions. And by the way, so <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to mention is that the introduction uh, was from my previous job. So I was at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism between 2004 and 2010. Before that, I was a professor of psychiatry at the University of Minnesota, doing research, teaching, uh, and running a, an addiction treatment program and developing programs. So I spent most of my career in academia and government. And when I left NIH, let me just say, when, from the standpoint or viewpoint of NIH, when I first got there, I sat back and said, well, what's the mission? What's the mission of the National Institutes of Health? Well, it's to improve the health of the country. So I sat around uh, with my staff there. I said, well, as a result of the research, wonderful research that's been funded here, um, are tr community treatment outcomes any better than they were 50 years ago? No. Was the prevalence of alcohol dependence any lower than it was 20 year, 30, 40, 50 years ago? No. Have we improved? Has this research improved the the health and welfare of the people of the country? No. Not only that, but it became very clear to me one of the main reasons for that. Because the research that's been funded by the National Institutes uh, of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and on Drug Abuse uh, has produced some of the most pristine neuroscience, epidemiological data, um, treatment uh, uh, research. Um, but I realized, especially from that vantage point, that in the substance use treatment field, we did not have a vehicle for getting 
those new treatments, new ideas, to the people who paid for the research. That our treatment system is not based on science. It was founded and formed in about 1950 to 55, and no matter what the marketing, the, mar the only thing that's changed from what I can tell is the marketing. But the, the, sub the, the substance of the treatment hasn't changed, and it's not really treatment. Rehab is the kind of treatment you do when you don't have a real treatment. Uh, and so, I mean, we, we, we used to treat breast cancer with prayer too, but we don't do that anymore, and we shouldn't be doing that with addiction anymore either. Not that I have anything against prayer, but it's not a medical treatment or a psychological or behavioral treatment. Anyway, in contrast to my colleagues in the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, when they publish a big study about a new approach to treating high blood pressure, cardiologists and other physicians read those articles. They go to professional meetings and they hear about the new research and they change their practice. Bertrand Russell once said in a famous debate, uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And in the rehab field, when the facts cha change, and they have changed a lot, the minds have not changed. So when we publish studies in our field, nobody who is running these centers reads them. And if, if, if it counters what they already know, they discount them. So when I left NIH, I thought, well, I could go back to some other academic institution and do more research and watch that sit on the shelf and collect dust, along with all the last 40, 50 years of research. Or I could try to change the system. And so that's what I've been doing now for the last five years. I formed a, con a company called Altier with a clinic, a demonstration project, that, to show how to do 21st century addiction treatment. It's located in St. Paul. And for the last three years, we've been basically inventing the model. No one's done this before, and it takes about three years to do it. You can't compress it. I've done this a number of times, and we're pretty much done with that now. And we've got proof of concept for a number of things. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about that in, in a minute, in terms of what, what we're finding. Um, let me go back to the beginning here. So, I'm just going to very briefly cover how well does the current system work, what, what does work, and Dr. Panalone has really pretty much gone over that, as has uh, Ann Fletcher, and so I, I won't spend a lot of time on that. How well does it work? Do people have access to up-to-date treatment? How do we get 21st treatment to more people? And how will research help us improve treatment? One of the things I was really struck with, with this recent big rally in Washington about addiction, and the emphasis was on sort of coming out. Okay, I'm a recovering addict and we're, we're strong and we, you know, and so forth. And I think that's fine. What really bothered me, though, was that there wasn't any emphasis on the need to fund more research. It's just about having more rehab. That's really a problem in our field. We don't have an advocacy organization that advocates for research funds. So uh, the advocacy organizations for heart disease, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease, autism, what are they always clamoring for? More funding by NIH to do more research. Nobody in our field speaks up for that. They say, we already know what to do, and we don't need more research to show that. But we don't know that. So the current system has about a 10% market penetration. About 10% of people with substance use disorders will access that treatment system, rehab, basically. And most people who go to rehab, almost all of them are forced to go. Rehab, the rehab industry is dependent upon the criminal justice system for the majority of its referrals. The second most common is an employer mandate, and the third is what I would call a family mandate. 
But nobody goes to rehab because they want to, because it's, a, it's an obnoxious treatment. It's uh, expensive, disruptive, stigmatizing, and old-fashioned. It's an anachronism. And it doesn't work any better than seeing a counselor once a week for 12 weeks. There's no choice. People don't have a choice. One woman, uh, a, few, a few months ago, there was an article in the Atlantic Monthly in which Altier Clinic was, was featured. And since then, the call, you know, been, phone's been ringing off the hook. Half the calls from, are from out of state. But one woman came to me, and here's the interesting thing, is 85% of them have been people on the very mild to at most moderate end of alcohol use disorders. These are people who are functional, but they're distressed. They, uh, these are people who get up and go to work in the morning, they're fine, their colleagues have, you know, don't know anything about their struggle with drinking. They, um, uh, they pick up their kids after school, they take them home, they help them with their homework, give them dinner, put them to bed, and then they go and they drink their two bottles of wine or their pint of whiskey. And they do that every night, even though they don't really want to, and they don't like it, and they're distressed. They're not seeking, they're not seeking treatment because they don't want it. They're not seeking treatment because it's not available to them in a form that's acceptable to them. So 85% of the people who have come as a result of this article have been people like that. Early intervention. So we're getting much deeper penetration into the affected population, just the same as with, and eventually treatment's going to all be, I mean, the alcohol and opiate treatment is going to be primarily done in primary care, just like it is now with depression. And, but one woman said to me, um, I've been looking for help since the 1960s, and all I could find was 12-step rehab until this clinic opened. It's not that people don't want help. So people need a choice. There's inadequate informed consent. It's the only place in healthcare where you can routinely lie to patients, where you can routinely fail to disclose what the scientific evidence is for the effectiveness of different types of treatments and what the alternative treatments are and get by with it. Any physician who practiced like that would be out of business in about three months. So people who are heroin addicts go to re abstinence-based rehab. They're taken off the, they're withdrawn from the opiates. They lose their tolerance. They're told if they work a program, an abstinence-based program, it'll work. There's not one study in the world that shows that while there's massive amounts of research demonstrating that maintenance on uh, a drug called Suboxone or on Methadone is very, very effective and very cost-effective. But people aren't told that. And, they, and, and these mostly young people now go out and they've lost their tolerance and the first time that they use, they use the same amount they were using before and they die of an overdose. This has happened over and over and over because they were lied to in rehab. The expectations are unrealistic. If you come to me and you've got asthma and I prescribe some inhalers, would you expect that would either one of us expect you would never, ever have another asthma attack the rest of your life? And if, you, if, it did, if you did, it would be a total failure? That's the expectation. Now, here's the worst thing of all. This is the only industry I know that has been so successful at blaming their customers for the failure of their treatment. And that puts a horrible stigma because recur it takes the average alcohol-dependent person five to ten years to stop in this country, and they do it through multiple quit attempts and multiple recurrences. That's why at Alter we say we don't just call addiction a disease. We treat it like one. Rehab is like sending a diabetic person to a spa teaching them diet and exercise and then saying go to support group for whatever you do, don't take insulin. Now, the, fi the one final thing, the one final thing I'm going to say is that in terms of the future, I just wanted to mention 
What needs to happen and is going to happen eventually is that substance use treatment needs to be mainstreamed into healthcare across healthcare completely. Most of it can be done in primary care. We need a robust medically based or medically anchored specialty treatment. Uh, I mean, a, a counselor with a GED preaching AA for four weeks is not a backup for a physician. And so we really need to reorganize care. We really re need to rethink who provides care and when and how. Medications are going to become increasingly important. That's why the neuroscience research is so important. Uh, there are new behavioral treatments that are going to go directly to implicit cognition that are going to be much more powerful than what we're using now. Most therapy will be provided, psychotherapy, on the web. And so those are some of the future directions, and I think the use, there's a lot for the use of technology as well. But I think the future is bright, but we need to make, we, we, the important thing is we have to make treatment available, accessible, affordable, and attractive. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Ready? Thanks, Mark. That's <laughs> it, Don. Nicely done. Thank you. William Moyers. Well, somebody's got to go last. <laughs> I'm honored and I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here and I have to admit to you I'm a bit perplexed too. I'm honored by the invitation to take part in this prestigious conference at this important institute of higher learning with a room and an agenda filled with experts with lots of credentials after their names, and in some cases before their names. So I'm honored, and I'm, but I'm also a little bit perplexed too, I have to be honest with you, because I'm not really sure what I can add to what you've already been talking about for the two days, or really add much more, or detract from what our other experts here in this panel with me have already talked to you about. The topic of our panel is what? Exploring different treatment options. And to that topic, all I can say is yes. Or absolutely. Or if I really want to get into it, of course. And if I really want to extrapolate and get into the detail of what it means to explore different treatment options, I could include this. When it comes to substance use disorders, a chronic illness, we all know that there is no cure for this illness, at least not yet, and despite the research of many people trying to find that cure, we know there is no cure for this chronic disease, but there is a solution, which means what? That treatment can and does work. There are many pathways to recovery, and there are millions of people who are in recovery from addiction right now even though among those millions of people, their definition of their own recovery may differ or be similar to mine and others. There are millions of people in recovery from that seemingly hopeless condition, including some in this room today, like me. I can confidently state these points that I just talked to you about, even though I'm not a doctor, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an MSW, I'm not an LADC, I'm not a PhD. All I got is a BA in journalism from Washington and Lee University, class of 1981. But I can speak to you confidently, I can speak to you confidently and in conjunction with this esteemed panel and the others that you've heard from, because I benefited from treatment. I am a prime example of the power of addiction, the effectiveness of treatment, and the promise and the possibility of recovery. Because in 1994, I got well. After four treatments in five years between 1989 and 1994, yes, this is what a chronic alcoholic and a drug addict looks like. These four treatments at the time between 89 and 94 were grounded in what we now would say is the traditional 
abstinence-based model that included, yes, it included the 12-step approach to, not treatment, but the 12-step approach to recovery. I even had two treatments at Hazelden, where I work, <laughs> followed by three years of abstinence between 1991 and 1994. Note I said abstinence, because I think it's important to the conversation we're having here and to the conversation we'll take back to our communities, that we talk about the fact that abstinence, at least as it relates to my biased perspective, is not recovery, as I would come to understand it, but at least during those three years between 91 and 94, I didn't use mood or mind-altering substances. And so during those three years in the early 90s, I functioned pretty well. I became a husband, a father of two boys. I worked as a journalist at CNN. I bought a house. I paid my taxes. And generally, I behaved. But I didn't recover. I didn't recover between 1991 and 94, even though I did not use substances, which means that I didn't take care of myself by taking care of my chronic disease, which means what? Well, it means that I relapsed on crack cocaine and malt liquor. Then I had two more treatments at a facility in Atlanta that was much like at the time, much like the approach that Hazelden was taking. And it was that fourth one, which ironically started for me on the morning of October the 12th of 1994, a couple of days from now. It was that fourth treatment where I finally learned to take personal responsibility by picking up the tools that I had been given by the counselors, the docs, my therapist, my recovery group, and other things, picking up those tools and beginning to work my own program of recovery by managing my chronic illness, keeping it in remission, and doing so for a long time now. A lot, as we've heard today, and as Anne talks about in her book, as you've heard from the other panelists today, a lot has changed in 21 years. For one thing, I'm a lot older, but seriously, What's changed is how we as a field, and I use that term in the broadest of sense, how we as a field have come to understand addiction for the illness that it is, and to come to understand it for the illness that it isn't. How we treat it, bringing to bear the best of what was, the best of what is, the best of those things in medicine, in pharmacology, research into the brain, the dynamics of, gene of genetics, and yes, I will argue that genetics does play a factor, the role of mental illness, and maybe most of all, recognizing all these decades after I last went to treatment, recognizing that treatment isn't the end of addiction, or it may be the end of addiction, but it's merely the beginning. It's the, merely the beginning of a process called recovery. And interestingly and notably enough, Recovery that has come to embrace a term that didn't even exist when I went to treatment in 89 or 91 or two times in 94, and that's the term recovery management. That is what really matters. All of those factors coming together to help us improve on what has worked, to get rid of what hasn't worked, and to give our patients and our clients a better chance. By the way, I have to echo something that Dr. Willenbring said, which I think is so critical, which is that we have got to mainstream addiction treatment and recovery into the healthcare continuum. And I think one of the most, Im I think one of the most important ways we have to do that for the benefit of our patients and our clients and their families is to take it back down to the community level where most people have to return to after they go to treatment. They have to return to their communities. I can think of nobody who's got that model down better than a friend of mine who is actually in the audience today. I think he's still here. Is Kevin Kirby here? 
Kevin, are you here? I can't, there you are back there. Kevin Kirby, you um, founded a Face It Together, a national organization in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that is taking this paradigm that we talk about as it relates to addiction treatment and mainstreaming it not just into healthcare and into the community. I think that is the future of treatment, however we practice treatment in this country. Thank you, Kevin Kirby, for what you're doing. That's all that really matters, is that we take all the things that we know and bring them to bear in a system, if you will, that works best and meets the needs of the patients and the clients, as Anne and others have said, where they are in that moment. It matters that we keep our perspective. It, it doesn't matter what our perspective or our expertise or our bias is. All that really matters is that we strive to get better at what we do by identifying the complexities of this illness, and I would argue that they perhaps are more complex than they ever have been, and that we apply, apply proven, some would say evidence-based, approaches to the treatment of it, and that most of all, we do this with the dignity and the respect that is deserved of our patients and our clients. That is all that really matters, isn't it? I didn't come here this afternoon, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I didn't come here today to, to, to debate or defend or attack one pathway of treatment over another. I'm here today to be part of the better understanding and to solve this. <laughs> Substance use disorders, addiction, whatever you want to call it. It is an illness that we like to think of, at least I like to think of as a Rubik's Cube. And yesterday when I was thinking about being here today with all these experts who know a lot more about this than I do, I thought about this disease as a Rubik's Cube and I put, I put Rubik's Cube into Google search to try to find out what the solution to this puzzle was. I don't try to do this puzzle because it frustrates me. When I put it into Google, up popped the official Rubik's Cube page and it said this, and I quote, it took Erno Rubik, the inventor of the Rubik's Cube, one month to learn how to do a Rubik's Cube. Some people started thinking about how to complete the Rubik's Cube back in the 1980s, and in 40 years have gotten a little further than one side. If you want to learn how to solve the Rubik's Cube, Look no further, this webpage promised. Getting help with solving the Rubik's Cube is not cheating. There are 42 quintillion possibilities, but only one correct solution. Well, fortunately for all of us here today, and for those who suffer with this illness, there are not 42 quintillion possibilities for getting help. And fortunately for us and for them, there isn't one correct solution. There are many. I was reminded of this three days ago right now when I was in the, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. When thousands of people turned out to the Unite to Face Addiction, it was a rally and a concert featuring, among others, Steven Tyler of Aerosmith, Joe Walsh of the Eagles, Sheryl Crow, and even I got to speak from the stage, and I didn't have to sing. <laughs> Looking out over that sea of thousands of people, and Dr. Willingbring mentioned the recovery advocacy that's going on in this field. Looking out over that sea of, of recovering people on Sunday, I was reminded that while we all have the same illness, we have found many different ways, pathways to the solution. And by the way, Dr. Willingbring, on that stage that day were members of all the national government uh, representing their causes and their interests. And the only point I will disagree with you on in your presentation today is that when we were all up on that stage, among the many things we advocated for was the fact that we need more research for prevention, treatment, and recovery management. At the end of, of, of the mall event and at the end of this day, this is, all that, what, this is all that matters at this Nobel conference. We, we are the lucky ones. We are the ones who help people get well. We are the ones who got well. And it is our responsibility to change the terms of the debate for the sake of those who still suffer. 
for the sake of those who are not here today. Thank you, panelists. Thank you all. So we've got probably about 10 minutes before we'll ask our other conference participants to come up and join us. So this time is just for us. And I open it up to you to respond to one another however you'd like. There's no order here. So if someone is ready to go. Well, I'd like to just say that where I, I just had the last word there, so to speak, but where I think we really need to move the conversation, and it's gonna take the other experts on the panel and all of you out there, is while we're paying attention to the importance of treatment, we've gotta figure out how we measure the importance of treatment and the effectiveness. What is good recovery? I mean, Bill Wilson, who was a co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, may have been clean from alcohol for 35 years, but he smoked himself to death. And so he was under the influence of a substance even though he was in recovery and had founded a, a movement that has benefited lots of people. So I guess the question I have for the, for, the, for the rest of the panelists is, when are we gonna start to pay attention to how we measure the outcomes that are as important to effective treatment as anything else? You know, I think, uh, <clears throat> if, I, if, if I may, I, I think there's actually excellent consensus now uh, about how to measure outcomes. I mean, we primarily measure substance use outcomes. Uh, the kind of more subtle qualities uh, of life, uh, for example, are, are extremely difficult to, to measure. Um, and uh, whether someone is satisfied with their life or what, whether they find meaning or, or that kind of a thing. What we can measure that is kind of a proxy for that is function. Mm -hmm. So employment, mm -hmm. are they, you know, are they married, are they able to have a relationship, you know, are they, are, are they, are they functioning at a good level, uh, in, you know, mm -hmm. those are the, so it's a combination of substance use uh, and how much and how often and, and uh, if there are, are, if they still meet criteria for a disorder, in other words, if their substance use is still causing impairment or distress, mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally, these, these measures of, of, of function, such as, well, Freud said, you know, uh, the purpose of life was to love and to work. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. But you well, I would add that um, client-centered outcomes, I think, should be paramount. I mean, you decided when abstinence was not enough and I, you needed to focus on recovery. Mm -hmm. That was a, a personal definition. I think we owe our clients, our patients, whatever you, you call them, the respect of having them tell you what is a good out outcome for them. And similarly, just as you said, abstinence does not necessarily confer recovery. You don't necessarily need to stop using everything and all of it in order to improve your life. Some people would have been thrilled with getting married, having a house, having a kid, and I think that needs to be part of the, the, the discussion here. We can't wait till somebody achieves complete mm. abstinence, our definition of a good treatment outcome, until we allow them to start working on their lives. I, I think that is a, a very important point. Well, and you mentioning Bill Wilson was also a miserably unhappy person, mm. um, and a lot, a lot of that was probably biological. We didn't, he stressed, from, from what I know, he suffered from horrible depression. Mm -hmm. We didn't have medications that we have now to deal with that. Um, and he was, you know, apparently much of the time he was writing the big book, he was sobbing his way through it. His secretary yeah. would walk in and find him with his head down on his desk. Yeah. And it emphasized to me, and I think you alluded to it once in your talk, but the, the incredible importance of treating co-occurring mm. um, mental health disorders at the same time. Um, the thinking for a long time, and still is at many treatment facilities, we have to deal with the substance use disorder as the primary disorder, then we'll deal with a co-occurring disorder. I mean, obviously you can't work with somebody who's drunk coming into your office every week, but you know, you can treat both disorders at the same time. Whichever one takes precedence at the time generally is the one that 
it, it switches, which the, the one that you deal with first, but they can be dealt with concurrently, um, and that's called integrated treatment, um, and that's the current approach that is considered to be progressive. But we've got to deal with both at the same time. And on that point, when I went to treatment at Hazel in 1989, I came out to Minnesota from New York because I had obviously caused a lot of problems back there. And, and I needed to go to a good place, and we found this place called Hazel. And um, at the time, although I didn't know it then, about 10% of the patients who came to what we then called residential treatment or inpatient treatment presented with mental health issues or mental illness. Today, it's about 85%. And some of that has to do with the fact that we're better at diagnosing it, but a lot of it also has to do with the fact that people are coming to treatment who are a lot sicker than they might have been in the old days when AA might have been a way that people could get into a recovery process without being treated for it. It's not well, like that anymore. Well, one thing, I mean, you're right about who, who goes to rehab, but uh, that's true for every disorder. So the people who are in, people who have asthma, who are, you know, who are, in, some people have a, a little bit of asthma, they go to the drugstore and get uh, some primatine mist and they're fine. Then there's a, the next group that doesn't work, so they go to their doctor, they get some prescription inhalers. They do fine. Then there's a group that has to take prednisone, steroids, and then they get steroid dependent and they get really sick. Then there's a group that's hospitalized, and then there's a group on the, in the ICU on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. So people in rehab in many ways are like the, uh, someone with asthma on an, in, in the ICU on a ventilator. And whereas most people in the community don't have anywhere near the same severity of disorder or all the coexisting disorders. Uh, so there is a bit of a, what we call the clinician's illusion here. It has to do with, uh, and, and a, the research has been a, uh, mm -hmm. The researchers have made the same mistake by focusing on what we call uh, uh, convenience samples, people in rehab, right, or in hospitals, they're focusing on the sickest 5 or 10 percent. Yep. And it's only until, only more recently that we really understood the extent of it. For example, 75 percent, it's 72 percent, but about three quarters of people who have an episode of alcohol dependence in this country have a single episode that lasts three or four years on average, and then it goes away and it never mm -hmm. comes back. Mm -hmm. The most common treatment outcome, or the most common outcome rather, 20 years after treatment, is what we now call non-abstinent recovery. It's about 40% of people who are drinking not very much, not very often, they have no alcohol-related problems. Then the next most common category is abstinent recovery at about a third. There's about uh, a quarter who uh, are, are much better but still have episodes of drinking, and then fewer than 10% still have active alcohol dependence. So the long term, for every, the, the only thing, the only substance use disorder where the long term outcome is, is, is not good is, is uh, heroin addiction. Yeah. I mean, heroin addiction has a 50% mortality rate between 25 and 55 if you, uh, um, uh, uh, if, if it's not treated appropriately. Right. Well, um, like, well, with all due respect, I think, you know, as important as it is to define the outcomes, we, our, our group here, our audience is here to figure out what kind of treatment, what constitutes good treatment. And I think, you know, we have a little bit of a division about evidence-based treatment versus treatment that is not studied, where there is no known effectiveness. And while uh, I respect the fact that many have come to places like Hazelden and have done well. That's one metric. That's one way of looking at it. Your asthma example, every level of care has FDA approval, <laughs> has knowledge bases, has physicians who know this is what the evidence says. Do people treat off-label? Do they do their own thing? Yes, but we have in every other medical condition a knowledge base that is based on empirical evidence. It doesn't mean that the only things that we study are the only things that work, but how about moving on and throwing away the old, to use your term, or the unstudied? You know, when I was, uh, at, uh, uh, when I was working in the uh, VA for a while, I was the first co-editor of the of VA and Department of Defense uh, practice evidence-based practice guideline for the management of substance use disorders. What was really interesting about that, that they use a, a very rigorous process across all disorders. And what emerged from that that was really interesting is that the evidence base across the continuum mm -hmm. 
uh, in substance use disorders is far stronger than in most areas of medicine. Yeah. And we, people don't believe that. No. People don't understand that. I don't think this audience would believe that the outcomes for substance abuse treatment uh, are on par with asthma, diabetes, and hypertension. Well, that's actually better. Ironic. And, and, actually and better. And better. I, and, and ironically, the compliance rates are better. The only reason we have such poor outcomes with opioid-dependent people, and again, this speaks to the issue with the opioid uh, overdose deaths, is that there is the poorest access to the medications right. that work for that problem uh, in that area, because people have very heated beliefs uh, not science, but beliefs about the medications that are prescribed for those. So if we had more access, we'd have fewer deaths. Yeah. On that note, we, we at Hazel and Betty Ford have had to change our treatment protocols as it relates to opiates. And we sort of are damned if we do and damned if we don't, because as a traditional abstinence-based program, we realized that our opiate patients particularly, they were doing well in treatment, but the moment they were discharged, they were dying. They were relapsing and dying. And so um, we've changed those protocols to include the use of medication while they're in treatment and then discharging them on those medications in a group setting among other things, not just letting them go and saying, here's your prescription, good luck. But, but all, when we started to do that and word of that became public, an old timer friend of mine who I actually owe part of my life to and saving me back in the early 90s, a traditionalist in the recovery program that he works, asked me to have coffee with him in St. Paul after he'd read this piece about the fact that Hazel and Betty Ford was using medication. And I sat down with him and he said, William, you're ruining AA. Well, I said, well, I couldn't do that even if I wanted to, but, but I said, what do you mean? He says, you're discharging people into recovery meetings who are under the influence. So, I mean, you know, we, look, I, I know how the 12 steps work and, and they work for a lot of people, but at the same time, they have been I don't want to say a hindrance, but they've been an, a challenge to move beyond, even as we understand more about the, the nature of this illness and how to treat it. You know, Carl okay, Jung once- Can I time us out here? I want to quickly and quietly invite our other conference participants to join this conversation. I really don't want to stop it. Mm -hmm. So if I could just ask you to come up quietly, you'll get mic'd up and we will just continue. So audience, please be quiet and respectful. So back to Mark Willenbring. So Carl Jung once uh, said, God save me from the Jungians. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's very, uh, it's almost universal that when you have charismatic leaders who form a uh, an organization, whether that's Jesus or Mohammed, uh, or or the Buddha, or uh, or Carl Jung, or or Dr. Bob, and mm -hmm. you know uh, the uh, the the followers frequently start to distort and get rigid, overly rigid compared to what the you know. Think of how many people have been killed in the name of Christianity or Islam. Right. Or, of all and, but it, it should yeah. be known that AA takes no official position on medications. So right. that's not AA's and there's position. Nothing, well, and actually, the big book says, talk to your doctor yeah. about it. We should not interfere. Right. So Amen. if we right. followed the, right. you know, the actual big right. book, right. Right. great point. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it, it should also be said, too, that, um, and it's one of the reasons I suggested Michael, Dr. Panelon, for the panel. Um, I, it was interesting. Um, and it actually is the way I got help for an alcohol problem many years ago. Um, I was talking with Dr. McClellan about, you know, the many different routes to recovery. And um, he's, again, the co-founder of Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia. And he said, we have no idea how much um, alcohol treatment or, or substance use treatment goes on behind the closed doors of, of an individual therapist. And in fact, it's probably more um, than other routes. But I don't know that there are any data to support that. I don't know if we know. I think there have been a few studies that have looked at that. But that when people come to me, I know when I was interviewed by Jane Brody for the New York Times before I was ready for interviews, the book wasn't <laughs> even done. Um, and she said to me, okay, I have somebody right here, right now. She was just making up a case. And they come to you and they say, I got a kid, um, a, a young adult kid, and he needs help, and what should I do? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not ready for interviews. Um, and I said, well, assuming it's not a real severe case where the person needs to go into detox, my first bit of advice would be 
to get an independent assessment. Try to find somebody in your town who has expertise with drug and alcohol problems who's not in, affiliated with a specific treatment program so that you get an unbiased uh, assessment of how bad that problem is and get their opinion about whether or not they need to go to a uh, treatment facility. Um, yeah, granted, they may have some investment about admitting that person to their private practice, but usually everybody in, that I know of is already full and you have to wait two months to get an appointment anyway. But anyway, get an independent assessment and um, there are, I mean, I can think of multiple people in Mankato who are in private practice who have expertise with substance use disorders and, um, and uh, co-occurring mental health problems at the same time. So there's lots of treatment goes right. on that way. And just to add to that, ask them what psychotherapies they practice. I, I'd use Anne's book. Go to the back, there are a list of questions, grill them about what approaches they use, and then find an addiction psychiatrist who prescribes those medications. And William wanted to jump right in here. here. He's just to waiting. say something, and then I'm going to be quiet the rest of the hour, I promise. <laughs> oh, but, no. No. Please but, don't. But no, but here's the thing, to, to Anne's point, and this is the great mystery of it all to me, who's more of a layman than anybody else here, uh, because I don't have the professional expertise like all of you do. But, and I think the mall we experienced three days ago was a microcosm of this bigger, great mystery that I'd love to delve into, which is the federal government a few years ago did some sort of survey which found that roughly 23 to 25 million people in this country consider themselves to be in recovery from some kind of substance use problem. Well, the 12-step movement says that they have roughly one to two to three million active members in their meetings on a regular basis. So the question is, where are the rest of us? How, how are we, how did we get into this thing and how are we continuing to do it? I think that's the great mystery. If we can tap those other 22 million people, then we'll have all the answers we need to treatment and recovery. Well, they're not in treatment. You know, yeah. very few people are in treatment. Fewer still yeah. get evidence-based exactly. treatment. Um, so I, I it, think that tells us something about what treatment is available to them that they perceive is available to them and what treatment is not. Yeah, I think it's really important to realize that the system will define who the treatment seekers are. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you have a system like we do now where the vast majority of facilities are focused on very ill, you know, very complicated and kind of intractable cases, then that's who you're going to see. And if, if, but, but it's sort of like we saw with the introduction of Prozac mm. uh, in 1988 with depression, where before that, I mean, if you, if you had depression, you could go to the state hospital, you'd get committed for six to 12 months, you'd get electroshock therapy and Thorazine, and not many people went. So you'd spend six months in bed being depressed rather than do that. Then when Prozac came along and there was a, a, a whole constellation, I think, of factors that created what I call the Prozac moment, all of a sudden people could go to their primary care doctor, and I think the penetration uh, so, and the characteristics of the people seeking treatment changed drastically. And I'm seeing that now in, yeah. in my practice because it, it's attracting all these more functional folks who are completely different, and none of them, have, you know, most of them have never been to rehab and wouldn't right. go. Exactly. And it wouldn't fit. They no. wouldn't fit. Wouldn't need it necessarily. You know? Owen, did you and I give each other a look that said, yeah, I've got a question? A so, uh, yeah, I, 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 that was very, very informative uh, from the audience. Thank you all so much. I, I have just a question uh, seek your wisdom on. Um, there's been a lot of mention of the sort of co-occurring conditions and the uh, increase in the large number of people who now come in. So, but this is related to a, a sort of a, a, a separate debate that's going on about the proliferation of mental health, uh, mental illness diagnosis in general. I mean, some people say with DSM-4, but especially with DSM-5, it is guaranteed that you are in there. Um, and uh, uh, I was there, uh, in fact, my son was one of the very first people uh, 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 to be diagnosed with ADHD and then the floodgates opened and there was a big discussion about the malady called boyhood or whether there's a real thing and we know that um, the uh, so I guess I just have a question about I mean there's this other issue about inflation of diagnoses of negative 
mental states or illnesses or, or problems on the one hand. So I worry about a confirmation kind of bias that we're just looking for that always. And we, of course, will see that if we look for it. And I wonder how you think, feel about that. You know, the major mental illnesses haven't changed. I mean, depression is on, on, on the rise worldwide, the prevalence of depression. For reasons is it the prevalence of depression, though, or is it the diagnosis the criteria? Of, no, it, it, it's, I think it's true prevalence, because mm -hmm. uh, the diagnostic criteria really haven't changed mm -hmm. substantially, and different studies <laughs> using different, tech, you know, different approaches have found the same thing. Uh, but the, the major mental illnesses, like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, have pretty much the same prevalence around the world. So, you know, which uh, I think would, where, we, where it gets uh, fuzzier is with anxiety disorders, with ADHD, with some of the, these my, on the milder end, the more functional end of the spectrum. Um, but uh, the, um, and certainly the change between DSM-4 and DSM-5 in substance use disorder diagnoses increased the proportion of people who met criteria right. quite dramatically, and they did so primarily by picking up what used to be called diagnostic orphans, where they would meet one or two criteria for alcohol dependence, but not, and you needed three. Right. So now they're picking those up. So, uh, it, and, 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 and so you have to take those things into, into consideration. But I, I, I think we're talking mostly about people with pretty severe right. mental disorders. Yeah. But William Morris, what was the statistic you gave? Well, 85%. when I was in, in 89, 1989, it was about one in 10 of the patients who came to our front door presented, and today it's 75 to 80 percent. I will tell you, too, that I, I, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so I don't really know how, if it's better or worse, but with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq of the last 10 to 12 years, we're seeing a lot of veterans Right. We're coming back with PTSD, and there's no doubt they got PTSD, and they're medicating it before they get help with alcohol or other drugs. Thank you. Mark Lewis? Yeah, this is uh, for Dr. Willenbring. Um, I, I don't think I've ever uh, heard a talk that I agreed with as much and disagreed with as much, both. <laughs> it, uh, I, I, a lot of the stuff you say really resonates for me, and some of it really doesn't. So. You, 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 you say things about the rehab industry, about how ineffective it is, how it sucks, how it lies to patients, and all that stuff, I agree. Uh, but you want more money for research, and we know that most of the research money uh, is spent by NIDA, uh, in or, by NIDA, by the National, uh, by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, right? And, and well, we've been well, told about, reliably coming, by, yeah. by a number of people that 90% of the research in the world uh, is in drug abuse is, is conducted by NIDA. And we know that they endorse the disease model of addiction. So you want more money to support research which is, supports a disease model which is then endorsed by the rehab industry which doesn't work at all. They endorse a different disease model. The rehab disease model, which is more the 12-step disease model, is significantly different than the biological, psychological, social disorder that we're talking about in the DSM. So while I know that you, you have, uh, would take contention with both types, it's not a contradiction as I see it. I think you're right, and that might help solve. So obviously the kind of disease model that, that uh, um, uh, William is, is, is describing is not the same as the kind that you're describing. But, oh. but let, let me just go on one, one more point, and then you can answer that as, yeah, as long as you want. Um, that is that you foresee a treatment uh, uh, approach based on um, community support and, and eventually internet-based connection between people, and yet you also want it to be uh, dispensed by primary care physicians who, from what I understand about the medical practice in the U.S., are charging huge amounts of money that has to then be approved by an insurance industry, which doesn't sound anything like the community. Um, okay, so the, you know, you, the, you, there's a complex set of, uh, <laughs> Interlocking, of, though, thing, of, of, of ideas that you had there uh, or addressed. Um, first of all, I would completely agree with, with uh, 
Dr. Panalone here, but in terms of the difference in the disease model, I call the old uh, sort of AA 12-step uh, disease model the pneumonia model. You've got something highly specific. You go into the hospital, you get highly specific treatment, you're cured. Yeah. Uh, and um, what we're really talking about is, you know, the whole issue of a beha brain-based behavioral illness, or uh, and I know you would object to brain-based, uh, but but behavioral illnesses, let's say. Um, and uh, the um, and and those can be you know, one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about is we're we're underusing public health approaches that could probably help many many more people than uh, any kind of treatment. You bet. Yeah. And, and in fact, more. In fact, most of the mortality and premature morbidity in this country comes from people who who drink. In a binge fashion, but don't have, don't meet criteria for a disorder. Yeah. So uh, we have this huge public health problem that uh, would be best addressed with public health, mainly mainly like raising taxes on alcoholic beverages. Um, so we're 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 really ignoring those, and 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 uh, so. But I'm just talking about the the in terms of the medical aspect. Um, you know, when, when I was a resident, there was an argument between, going on between psychoanalysts. Mark, could I ask you to speak a little more clearly or loudly? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Having I'm a sorry. Here. Oh, sure. I'm, maybe is that That's better? better? That's yes, better. Thank you. It was position. So when I was a resident many years ago, uh, there was an argument going on at the time between psychoanalysts and psychopharmacologists about treatment of depression. And the psychoanalysts argued, no, you should not give them medication because it will destroy their motivation for, for examining and resolving their conflicts in psycho, psychoanalysis, which actually turns out not to be effective for depression. But, but the, the, it reminds me very much of this dichotomization uh, that we're experiencing here. So medications are simply tools that address some aspect of the phenomenology. But medication is really only even relevant for opiate addicts, and you know, for a week or so, maybe for in, for extreme alcoholics. I mean, we're no, not no, talking no, no, about no, no, no. That's they, not what the yeah. no. I, I mean, no. The uh, well, well, what kind of medication are you going to give coke addicts, sex addicts, uh, methamphetamine addicts? Uh, you know, okay. I mean, all so the, the, where we have good medications, where we have good medications, are for alcohol and opioid use disorders and for smoking. We don't have good medications now for stimulants uh, of any type, and when and we, for the most part, don't have medications for what you you call these, you know behavioral compulsions that don't involve substances. I'd like, like to, to, yeah, I'd like to bring our focus um, so that we may address some of the departing college students and high school <laughs> students. <laughs> The binge drinkers, okay, yeah. so we're here to talk about treatment, but that, you don't just treat people who are at the far end of the severity right. spectrum. You treat people along the way. You may call it prevention, but I call it treatment. If you have mild asthma or if you're moving towards it, there are things you can do. Binge drinkers are moving towards an alcohol use disorder. So for the binge drinkers, we're not here to send them to rehab, do an intervention, or say that they have to completely stop drinking. Let's meet them where they are and help them to reduce. Teach your children, teach the students here that you know, no more than seven drinks a week or more than four an occasion for a woman, uh, no more than 14 drinks a week or no more than four uh, on an occasion for a man um, is what is considered low-risk drinking. How many people know that? When people exceed those limits, there are evidence-based studied treatments to bring those levels to low-risk amounts, which then makes it less likely that they end up becoming an alcoholic down the road. So there are a range of treatments along this entire spectrum. For example, the medication naltrexone, which basically blunts the effect of alcohol, uh, has been shown uh, in, in uh, sort of relatively low dose to reduce binge drinking among college students. It makes it easier to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So naltrexone's been around for 40 years, and uh, naloxone, what, 40, 50 years. And so what, what, 
all this research funding, I mean, you're, you're basically talking about the physical addic the problems that have to do with phys uh, you are these Medicaid. That, there's a psychological well, overlay. Hang on, there's a psychological overlay. If you can help to relieve physical suffering, of course, that's going to assist a process of psychological adjustment. But I mean, what other sorts of medications are you looking for, given that addiction is primarily a psychological problem? Oh, I, 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 it's much more complex. I think if we've shown anything over the last two days is that we can't say it is this one single thing. It's a lot of different things that needs a lot of help from multiple angles. I think, tell me if, uh, how you all feel about it, that the number one problem in terms of addiction is the lack of knowledge and access to evidence-based treatment. Here, here. That is the number one thing. If, we, if you leave here with only one thing, from my perspective, so with all due respect, is that there is much more science on what works out there and that you, you, you got to grill people in your community to either give it to you or figure it out or find an expert and bring them in. Your primary care doctor should be able to help you with your kids in terms of substance use problems or addiction. And there are good uh, behavioral therapies, yeah. and, yes. and, and they're best combined, or sometimes that's all people need. Um, and I really think the future is in much more direct intervention with implicit cognition. Yes, I like that. I agree with that a lot. Um, well, so so I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a reductionist yeah. that way. But so, why should, if, if there's a medication available that makes it easier for people to achieve their goals, psychological goals and social goals, why should they not have access to that? And I'm just saying, like mindfulness, which is back, by the way, one of the most effective treatments, has been around for 2,500 years. Uh, so I'm not, you know, this is not like we don't need, I just don't think we need new research into uh, the sorts of things you're talking about. As much as we need a real shift, a major, major 180 degree shift in the way we think about addiction, the way we define it. And I am going to take a little moderator discretion and say thank you to everyone who has participated in this conference, from the organizers, Scott Burr, our dining service, our physical plant who has made this room immaculate, to all the multimedia, to all the students who have acted as hosts, and Yay. you're the best. Yeah. And to speak and say thank you from many of my friends who are addicted, and I myself am addicted, to say it has been incredibly empowering to see this room filled with people who care. So thank you. Thank you. And I remind you that if you have a ticket for the banquet, that begins at 6.30. Mark Lewis is our banquet speaker. His talk will be at 7.30. It'll be streamed. So if you don't have a ticket, you may watch it in Alumni Hall in the O.J. Johnson. I almost said O.J. Simpson. O.J. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Student Union. Oh, I'm sorry. And may this conference have planted some seeds as President Bergman said in her opening comments about what we can do. So stay well, thank you. Have a good day.